I'm going to uh, start with asking a quick question. Has anybody actually read this book in this room? <laughs> Very good. Okay. The five of you who put your hands up, I'll, I'll add my hand to that. Um, I had the misfortune or fortune to go to Oxford, and Tony Hall was the professor of computer science. And so everything was either ML or CSP. And um, I can answer Rob's question about where channels came from. Uh, they are actually in this paper in 1979 towards the theory of communicating sequential processes, which comes after the 78 paper. And this is, it actually says, we're going to have this problem with these processes talking to each other. The technique we'll have is a channel. And uh, the only real difference with what's in Go is that um, there is a small thing in here, which is there's a channel generating process where you go get a channel from if you need a new channel. But that, that's where they come from. Now, CSP is actually kind of an interesting thing in that uh, everybody talks about it, but nobody seems to quite know what it is. Um, th there's a really important thing in CSP, which is that uh, fundamentally, if you look at it, communication and synchronization are, are the same thing. Uh, in the original CSP, there's no buffering. And if things need to communicate, they actually have to synchronize on something that's happening. And uh, Tony Hall was, I think, obsessed with chocolate vending machines. We did actually have a chocolate vending machine in the programming research group. And almost all the introductory examples are like this. One process here is a vending machine, and it can do a coin. It can participate in, participate in, that's important thing, a coin event. And then it can participate in a chocolate event. <laughs> um, and then true to the one in the programming research group, it then breaks. Uh, that's what stop does. Um, and then a human um, can, who is either going to pay by coin or in a slightly updated version card um, can either put money in or try to use a card and then stop. Um, and a vending machine, so the interaction of these two things is by synchronization. And the communication here is the coin. So a vending machine and a person get together and they agree on participating in a coin event. Um, and at that point, the communication has happened. The vending machine now knows there's money in it and chocolate comes out. And there's no notion here of channels in the, in the original thing. So it was all about this communication thing. It's completely impractical to program like this. I mean, it'd be a complete nightmare without any sort of communication. So, of course, we get, we get channels. And then, uh, so in this talk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to stop talking about CSP, but I do, it, the book is worth reading because it covers a lot of implementations. Um, and it, did anybody, has anybody other than me programmed in OCAM here? Okay, we can have like a support group or something afterwards. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so Occam had very specific, uh, very, very similar uh, syntax for, for channel communication. So in Go, there's this nice, um, let me see, is this going to work? Here we go. There's this nice idea in, um, uh, of channels, right, which is these communications. And just like in CSP, they are essentially, they're bidirectional, right? You can communicate in either direction. There's an agreement between two, two processes to communicate. And so if you're not familiar with the syntax, how many people here are relatively new Go programmers? I'm kind of curious about. OK, great. So some of this is quite introductory. And some of it is get, gets more and more complicated. We'll see how far I get. So obviously, sending and receiving on channels. Um, and you can also find out if a channel is closed or not, uh, which turns out to be quite useful for quite a number of situations. And um, the fundamental thing is there's an agreement. And in general, uh, this is really displaying my CSP background. Uh, unbuffered channels are mostly best. And the reason they're mostly best is they make reasoning about things simple. Because you know that if this guy and this guy are communicating, they're doing it right now, and there's no ambiguity about it, and there's no races happening, and it's interesting things. So you can, it makes it dead easy. And this is um, one of the beautiful things about sequential programming like this with, um, with the concurrency is that it's actually really easy to reason about if you have these synchronization points. It's just not hard. You can, easily, you can just look at a piece of programming and go, oh, this is what's happening. For example, in this silly little example I have here, um, there's, a, there's a something which thinks of a random number, and there's something that receives that, that number on a channel. Uh, two completely separate processes. These would be processes in the CSP perspective. Um, but you know that those things, at that moment, those two things agreed on, on that thing happening. And so for, from a communication perspective, that, you know, if you're going to use, do things, don't get tempted. I think it's quite tempting to go, hmm, how much buffering should I have in this channel? The answer is zero, uh, unless you uh, have a really good reason to do it. And there are good reasons. So one of the interesting things about the fact that it's communication and synchronization at the same time is that it turns out the channels are quite used to, useful without actually sending any data for just signaling things that happen. So um, sometimes it's good enough just to wait 
for a channel to be closed. So if you want to wait for something to happen, so in this example, I've got a Go routine, um, it's going to do something and it's going to close a channel, and then some other thing, maybe it's the main or some other Go routine, just sits and waits for that channel to disappear. There's no actual communication of data here, it's just a synchronization event. But it's very, very explicit. It means it's very easy to examine what's happening in this program. And you could have also just transmitted instead of closing. You could have sent something on that channel, it would have been the same thing. The nice thing about closing it is, is you're done with it. It's, it's, it's all over at that point. Um, you can do the opposite thing, right, which is you can start 1,000, 10,000 Go routines, however many you start. I mean, we, we at Cloudflare have ridiculous numbers. I mean, it's, it, you never even think about it. The tens and tens of thousands running. Um, and you can coordinate them. So this one, it runs 100 Go routines, which have all got this start channel. And the first thing they do is they all wait for something on that channel. And then the master routine says, I'll close that channel, and all 100 start doing whatever they need to do. So if you need to coordinate something, there's two lines of code. Uh, that's a really, really beautiful, beautiful thing to be able to do. Now, the real power um, in both, you know, I think in both Go and in, in CSP originally comes from the ability to choose from a number of possible events. And the, the key thing in Go is to choose from channel communications. So, of course, we have uh, the select statement, which allows us to do a, an interleaving of receiving things, sending things, um, and a default case, which turns out to actually be more useful than, than you might realize, um, for communication. So you can build multiplexes with this. You can have routines that are waiting for something to happen, having timeouts. Um, I think that the heart of many uh, um, Go programs has something of a for select kind of loop. There's some sort of thing in the middle which is coordinating what's, go what's going on. Um, for example, one thing you can do with... Uh, with a select is you can have some go routines. I've got here 100 go routines and um, I'm going to tell them all to die at some point by having a select statement which has got obviously a, there's a bit of a elided here but where it's doing something and it's also willing to receive a message on a die channel and of course rather than just receiving a message because I'm going to have hundreds of these things I'm just going to close that channel and what happens at that point is that th that will occur and all the go routines will, dis will disappear. So again really beautiful right it's it's two lines of code, basically, to say something that would have been horribly complicated in, in, in other languages. Now, if you are just coordinating with, with a Go routine, then uh, another thing you can do is you can use the bidirectional nature of a channel. And this is also where the reasoning about unbuffered channels is really, really key, is you can do something like this. You can have a Go routine. You can send it a message down the bottom there saying, I want you to die. And it can reply and say, OK, I'm done. I've terminated, I've cleaned up, or whatever. And there's no ambiguity about it here. If you look at the, the main routine where it says it sends true to the die channel, the thing after it cannot receive that. It can't suddenly get received by the receive that's happening next because someone else has to agree to receive and that somebody else has to be in a different process. So it's really simple to, to look at. You don't get any ambiguity about what's happening. Now, there's some interesting things about um, channels that are closed and channels that are nil which are rather, rather curious. So this is what I've talked about now is sort of standard communication with channels that are actually working. But if you look at um, closed channels, there's an interesting thing about them is they don't, they don't block. So if you take this first example, I make a channel, I close it, and then I receive from it. Um, I'll always get something. I'll always get the, the zero value for that channel. And um, if uh, I use the OK syntax, then I'll actually get a thing saying, hey, by the way, that, that channel has been closed. Um, if I try and transmit on it, I get a panic, right? The, lo the last one, it never blocks. It blows the entire program up. So don't do the last one right? because that's, that's, not, that's not designed. But um, so that, that can be very handy in some programs, and I'm going to show you why in a minute. Now, a another interesting thing is closing of a buffered channel. So when you have a buffered channel, something different happens, which is if there's data in the buffer, it doesn't just disappear. So you can, the close is like an end-of-line marker for a buffered channel. So if you do something like this, I make a channel, I put three ints in it, I close it, and then I read them back. I, I'm actually draining that channel. And if I try to read past the end of it, I'm going to get the zero value. And if I use the OK form, I'd get a thing saying closed. And this, of course, is how the range operator works, be it on a buffered or, or an unbuffered channel, which is it will read up until the end of until the channel becomes closed. The difference there between the buffered and the unbuffered is whether something can be sort of sitting, sitting in the buffer. Now, the classic thing about um, the, other, the other good thing that comes from the sort of this, the CSP world is that uh, the internal state of some process can be completely hidden, and you just communicate using 
uh, synchronization in CSP and channels in Go. So you can do something really si simple like this. You need to have something that generates unique IDs in some way. So you make a Go routine, and that Go routine is always willing to give you a new ID on a channel. So in this case, I've done a sequential one. It could be a char of something. It could be whatever generator you want. And you, then wherever you go, when you uh, ask for something, uh, you ask for an ID on that channel, you get a unique ID. And what's nice about that is that there's no question about, is there any way I could get the same ID twice? Or No, there's a, there's a synchronization happens. If you look at that routine at the top there, it transmits the current ID it's got, and then it adds one to it. And you know that those things have happened. There's no, there's no ambiguity about that. When you're hiding state like that, you can hide quite complicated things. So this is a little, little uh, routine that could run as a, as a Go routine that uh, is used to recycle byte buffers. So you know, quite often, especially in code that I'm dealing with as network stuff, you have just chunks of memory which contain data that came from somewhere. Um, and you have lots of these things, and it can put a lot of pressure on the garbage collector if you keep them around, uh, if you keep throwing them away and getting them and getting them again. So it can be quite nice to say, hey, I've, I've used this block of memory. Could you hang on to it for me for a minute, and I'll, I'll get it back if you need it. So here's, here's an example of this. This can be run as a Go routine. It has a given a get channel, and it can, um, you can ask it for a, a buffer. Uh, it makes 100-byte buffers by default. Um, it uses the list package. But all that's completely disguised. A user of this would just say, hey, I just, can you just make me a, um, a byte buffer of 100 bytes? And you would either get one that had been previously put back by, by writing to the get channel, or if there was nothing there, it would make one, a new one for you. So this is something, and, and so you can make much more complicated versions of this if you feel like it. Now you can, it turns out that this, you don't need to do this with lists because this is where buffered channels turn out to be useful, um, and you can do something like this. Now this is where the default clause in select is super useful. So um, you can make a non-blocking receive using select. So what I'm doing here is I've made this um, channel of byte buffers, and it's buffered, right? So I've got, I can have up to five of these things kept around. And um, if I need one, I've, I'm going to try and get one from that idle channel. And if I can't get one, then I'll make a new one. So I'll, just, I'll create a new slice of the size that I need. And so this is rather nice. So if, if, the, if this buffer of you know, available slices is empty, then the default channel comes into effect. Um, this won't block. It'll, it'll always give you something new. And you can put things back in a similar way. So if this uh, five, this channel with a you know, buffering length of five was full, then it couldn't, you couldn't put a buffer back onto it. Um, in which case, the default clause would happen, and you just let the garbage collector deal with it. So, if you just go back over that, you can, the, in, in basically in two, you know, two small select statements, you can build yourself a very simple memory recycling um, system. And of course, it doesn't have to be, you know, slices of bytes. It could be any arbitrary thing that you need to pass around. And this, this, this is super powerful. All right. Another, uh, another interesting thing is nil channels. Now, nil channels do the opposite, really, of closed channels, which is that they, they always block. Um, so, if you try to read from one. You, well, if you tried to run this, uh, you would actually it would tell you that all your Go routines were stuck and you couldn't do anything. And if you try to transmit, you can't do it. But they turn out to be useful because you can selectively turn on and off bits of a select statement using nil channels. So I've got a little example here of this is something you might see in a, uh, inside a Go routine somewhere. It's looping around, receiving things on two different channels. Um, and if what, whatever those things are, obviously we we'll do something with them. Um, if one of those channels gets closed, it then says, okay, I'm going to forget about this channel from now on, but I'm going to keep processing. So, for example, in the first branch there, it says, right, okay, well, if this channel C1 has been closed, then I'm going to nil it out. And that means that the next time you go into that select loop, um, that case will essentially be non-existent because it, it will not try to receive on it. If you didn't do that, then you would actually go around forever here because you keep getting the zero value if that channel was closed, you could just loop forever going around. And in fact, here you can, this, will, this particular construct will wait until those two channels have both been closed and then terminate, return whatever, whatever function you're on. So nils can be really handy because you you're essentially just turning off a case in that case. And it works for transmitting as well. You can do the same thing. So here's a thing that um, it, uh, it's a source of random numbers. I don't know why I like sources of random numbers, but I always do. 
Um, it's a source of random numbers until you tell it to shut up. So you can read things from it, and uh, if you then send it a message on this D channel, it nils out its own source, and in fact, this program will then, will then block because it's got nowhere else to go. It would probably be more useful to do something else that maybe it would flip into not giving you random numbers. Maybe in NSA mode, it would give you something that looks like a stream of random numbers, <laughs> and then it would, you know, it would be all right. So um, this, is, this is not, it's not recorded, right, this talk? <laughs> okay, so um, timers. I just want to just... A couple of other things that tend to, tend to be useful in real life are um, doing things with the time package. There's, there's useful things in the time package uh, for timeouts. So, so one of the real things that happens is you get one of these select statements. It's got all this nice communication going on, all these things, and something goes horribly wrong, and you have to go, whoa, you know, communication has died. Um, at Cloudflare, we have a thing written in Go, which is called Railgun, which is a, a network compression package. It has bit to go programs that run across the internet, across vast distances, in fact, that's its purpose. And you know, if, if one end disappears, then you want to know about that in some way. And if it's undetected for some reason, then timeouts are a good thing. At some point you've got to go, hey, I should really have heard something by now. Um, now, when we first implemented Rail, one of the things Railgun does is it talks to web servers using the HTTP package. And um, we had a 30 second timeout. If the, if that web server has just literally not got back to us in 30 seconds, it's dead. Uh, it turns out that there are web servers that uh, we had one customer who said it's not working uh, because it was legitimate when you did a GET request for there to be a two and a half minute wait for the response. Um, and so I, you know, it was a database package basically and it was doing a query and that query took two and a half minutes. And so we obviously had to fix that with some other techniques. but. Um, the time package allows you just to get a channel, and that channel will send a message after whatever time you feel like. Um, and these two examples are, are using one for the whole loop or resetting every time you've been around, so you can reset the timeout every time something useful happens. Um, uh, heartbeat is a similar thing. The, the tick thing just gives you one regularly. So if you, if you need to keep some connection alive somewhere or mention to some operator the thing is not actually dead yet, um, it can be useful to just do do whatever your, the heartbeats are in this, this kind of thing. What I have found powerful about programming Go is that if you look at these examples, writing this sort of stuff in other languages would have been quite messy. And what's nice about, particularly about the select statement, is you can very easily throw in something like, oh, I need timeouts as well, or oh, I need a way of coordinating termination. Um, all this can be done with channels. You don't need to go looking for some other construct. Channels fundamentally it. And of course, Paul pretty much said this in the 78 paper, which is you can do everything with this, guys. Um, this was typewritten and quite hard to read. Um, all right, so some sort of just some little examples of slightly larger programs. Um, network multiplexing. So I've got here some, I, I throw up 100 Go routines that create some sort of messages. Um, we don't know what they are, they create some text messages. And then we have some main loop which reads those messages as they come in and sends them on a network connection to somebody. Um, this is a good example. You know, multiple Go routines can just write to the same channel. There's no, there's no concern about that. Uh, multiple Go routines reading from some channel are going to get strange behavior because you're not going to quite know who's going to read. But here, this is just there's a multiplexer right there. Zero, zero work to do that. I mean, it, it fits on one slide in big type. Um, another great example is. Um, first to the n, you know, you want to do n things and you want to just run through them. So this is the thing that uh, spins up um, a bunch of Go routines that try and get some URL and they all try and transmit a response and you just receive the first one. You just go, hey, first one, whoever won. I hope it will be the Cloudflare CDN, but um, I won't run it here live just in case it's, uh, <laughs> just in case it's the Google one or something. You never know. I mean, <laughs> um, all right, um, another common technique if you get into this is to, if you uh, are sending requests to some Go routine, uh, um, if you have multiple things writing to a particular Go routine, you need some way to get things back. You, it's difficult to use the same channel if there are many people. In fact, it's, it's impossible. So the, the way in which this is done is you typically pass a request in with a channel to get the response back on. So this is a fairly simple thing here, which is just saying, hey, I want you to go get some URL for me, get the contents of it, and um, here's a channel where you can give me the response. 
And so that, because the channel can have any type on it, you can pass in here a structure which has, hey, here's the URL, here's the channel, give me the response. On, and you just listen to the response. So again, this, this, this technique, very simple. We use this a lot, a lot in real code. Um, all right, so if you wanted to do, if you happen to be working for a company that's a large CDN, um, <laughs> that <laughs> needed to do something like this. So you've got some, uh, you know, you've got some limited number of HTTP clients you, you, that can request URLs, and you want to have some way to go get them, um, but you need some sort of load balancer, right? You've got some limited pool of, of things you can hit to get, get URLs from, but you've got some incoming stream of requests. So, so how can you make a load balancer and go? Well, um, turns out that's not very difficult. So. Uh, we can start with this, uh, this getter function, and what the getter function is going to do is it's going to say it's going to um, receive jobs. So it's, there's a worker, and it has a getter. It's going to receive a job to do. It's going to do that job, which is get a URL. That job's going to have a uh, response channel in it. It's going to send the response down it, and it's going to say, hey, I finished doing this job. I can do some more work. So the fundamental thing is just going around, trying to get jobs off of, off of a channel where it's being given work to do. The job is just a URL to go get. Um, and then you have a fairly simple function which goes off and says, all right, so if you look at the main here, I'm going to build myself a load balancer, and I'll show you the load balancer function in a minute. Um, and I'm going to read a whole bunch of URLs from a file or from a standard in, and I'm just going to go run a whole load of Gurity. So what this is going to do is it's going to for every line in that file, it's going to start. You know, it's a 10,000 line file, 10,000 go routines. They're all going to hit the load balancer, but the load balancer is going to be restricted to uh, these parameters we're going to see in a minute are the number of individual getters and the depth of the queue each of them can have. So you just arbitrarily go run those things, and uh, we're just going to then sit and receive the answers. And the answers is going to be the, uh, the content of the, of, the, of the URL that was requested. So. Fairly simple to get started. This is a typical kind of, yeah, hey, here's a load of work to do. Go run that thing. The thing that gets it is fairly simple. It just does it. So how do you balance across those things? So the way in which that works is um, there's a queue of jobs, um, and there is, there's a collection of workers, uh, which are those go routines that I showed you that can do those, those getting things. They each have a queue associated with them. And basically what happens is there is a go routine which runs through the through the workers looking if, they, looking if their queue is empty or not and queuing up jobs for them to do. And as the messages come back in saying, hey, I'm done, they decrement the queue for that, that, particular, uh, that particular worker. And they, they, what happens when you actually run this, uh, I have some graphs from a different presentation, it just all of them spin up, they get a nice queue, full queue, and this little routine here keeps them up with a, a queue of length uh, depth here, which I set as 10 for them to all have work to do with one channel receiving all the responses back. Now that's actually quite a complicated piece of code to do in pretty much any language. And, and in Go, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty, pretty simple thing to do. Um, that's it, that's what I was gonna talk about. I'll, I'll upload the slides to uh, the SlideShare and the code is on our GitHub. And uh, yeah, questions? Anybody have a question? On the way? So I have a, a question around, uh, so a lot of this talk was showing things that are really difficult in other languages to do with their concurrency primitives uh, that Go channels make really nice and easy. Uh, have you found any inverse cases where you know some language feature makes this concurrency primitive really nice and in Go it's kind of wonky and hard to do? Um, well, I, I, it's, it's interesting you say that. I, so I mentioned, you know, we do a lot of different languages, right? Um, and the reason we're using Go for particular things at Cloudflare is because we have the sorts of problems that I think Go is great for, which is things where there's lots of concurrency, um, things often where there's some I.O. portion, so networking bit that might take some time, so there's, you can go off and be doing something else waiting for that to happen. Um, but I mean, it's easy to think of lots of examples that I wouldn't do in Go. I mean, you know, the number of times I reach for Perl to do some string processing thing, 
you know, I, I, I would not dream of doing it in uh, in Go because it just be it just be a lot of work where you've got you know great features in, in different languages. So um, I don't have any experience of Erlang. Are there Erlang people here? I'm actually super tempted to try something in Erlang just to really understand the, the model. Um, and also because we do a lot of networking stuff just to do packet matching type things. Um, but I think, you know, to be honest with you, if today I looked at a problem and I said, hmm, this problem involves lots of concurrency, um, it doesn't have you know, super tight space in memory restrictions, like it's not gonna have to run on an Arduino. Um, and is, especially if it's doing lots of networking things, I would just use Go, it just works. You know, we've been running it in production for two and a half years, I think. And it just, I was saying to somebody on the plane over, one of the things that's been nice about it, because I, I, when I joined Cloudflare, I just wrote this product in Go, I didn't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> and uh, I just sort of announced it when it was ready. I was kind of like, oh, by the way, it's written in Go. And um, you know, I think there was a bit of a risk that it, you know, it might have been a language that was crashing or changing, and then there's, there's two things. It's been stable in terms of a language specification, and it's been stable in terms of a runtime. You know, we, we, you know, if you look at a cat picture on the web, um, it probably went through a Go program at Cloudflare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what better endorsement could there be? I mean, <laughs> <laughs>